Hello, everybody. Bonjour. Um, thanks for sticking around. Welcome to our session, Living of the Land Techniques in Managed Kubernetes Clusters. My name is Shay, Shay Berkowitz. I'm uh, proud to be a part of Amazing Wiz Threat Research Team. You might know us from these projects and with me today. And I'm Ronan Schustin. I'm from the Wiz Vulnerability Research Team. And you might know us from cool researchers like Broken Sesame, uh, Bing Bang, uh, and many more. All right, so what are we talking here today? Living of the land techniques. Let's go to basics. Let's start with the definition. Merriam-Webster dic Dictionary defines living of the land as getting food by farming, hunting, etc. Okay, we know that. But there is this element of using what's available in the environment. And that's so true for classic cybersecurity definition, right? Albeit in a classic definition, it's talking more about binaries, binaries on the host, right? So the, the, those two big projects, GTF, GTFO beans, Lolbus projects, that pretty much a list, categorized list and collection of the binaries that can be exploited by the attackers once they have the initial access on the host. Okay, so my favorite from the OSCP days, for those in the know, uh, was the Certitil, which I used to download enumeration scripts from on, to my Windows host um, in the absence of curl or wget, for example. That's a classic example. And that's fine. That was okay back then when, when we said initial access and attacker, we thought about VM or host, perhaps after escaping some kind of application, web application, right? Finding the RC. However, this has changed. Right now, attacker might find themselves in different contexts. It can be pod within the Kubernetes, of course. It can be node. It can perhaps even be Lambda function, right? They might own the Lambda function in the cloud, OK? So as the definition of attack chain and the attack processes has evolved, so should the definition of living of the land techniques evolve, just like the Metapod Pokemon. OK, so for the definition, for the updated definition, I want to take you to the CISA joint guidance. Um, so they released it in February 10th, if I'm not mistaken. So pretty much uh, a month ago, uh, CISA and allied agencies released the guidance for on-prem and cloud living of the land techniques. And even though they released it past our CFP submission and acceptance, we thought it's going to be a shame not to include it because uh, what they found there, their thoughts really resonated with us. So let's take the, their definition. Native tools and processes on systems. I would also add workflows. And second point is lower likelihood of being detected or blocked. Okay, so I think those are two important points that uh, describes uh, together uh, come up the, de the, de the definition. But now, what makes living of the land techniques, let's say LOL techniques, different from other attack scenarios? Well, there are three points. First, there's a lack of established baselines on the defense side. Second, the lack of conventional IOCs. And third, it, it just makes attackers' job easier, right? Because they avoid, they don't need to uh, develop their own tools, they just use whatever they have. So altogether, it makes a real problem to recognize, to detect LODL techniques, okay? specifically in Kubernetes clusters. Now, CISA guidance talks about cloud and on-prem, which is a shame because we're at KubeCon, so we want to extend it to Kubernetes. Not just extend, but also enumerate. So we'll present a series of demos about those techniques to persuade you that this is a real problem, that there are multiple techniques are there, and we will try to standardize them somehow. For standardization, we'll use threat metrics. Don't worry, not this one. We'll focus on the Kubernetes threat metrics, OK? Now, when we're talking about threat metrics, which stages of the threat metrics the LODL techniques are actually applicable to? Pretty much all the stages, like beside the initial access, pretty much everything, maybe even impact, is pertinent to LODL techniques. They can be abused anywhere. Why manage clusters? Why are we talking about managed clusters specifically? Well, using the academic language, it's because they have lots of stuff. OK, uh, default AKS cluster, empty cluster that you stage. It has all these workloads running. You see the like three namespaces, a bunch of workloads. So 
we can abuse this, right? Additional services means more complexity, means increased attack surface. It's always true. And we love attack surface as security researchers. Okay, where can we take the, the LODL techniques? Well, of course, attackers in the typical scenario, attackers, attackers find themselves uh, in the execution into the pod, right? Like some kind of application they see, they find, they execute in the pod. So there's a pod image binaries. But it's, it's not very interesting. It can be CentOS, which is huge, but it could be also DistroLess, which doesn't even have shell. And so there's a huge variance in the, um, in the LODL binaries that attackers might find there. Uh, but how about Kubernetes node image? That's more stable. You can see in EKS, GKS, AKS, all their AMIs pack tons of tools, useful tools, in this case, for just to download something from the internet. Do you really think Kubernetes worker node needs SFTP? I'm not sure, I don't know, but it's there, so we might use it. Okay, but this assumes that the attacker has Kubernetes node access, which is not always true, of course. Okay, then what else can we use? We can use middleware workloads. Deployment, stateful set, Kubernetes object. Diamond set, even better. Why? Because they run on every pod, so it doesn't matter where attacker finds themselves, they can use that workload. Also, cron jobs, jobs, which is great. Why? Because they are periodic in nature. But also users and groups. And the various managed solutions, they add their own users and groups on top of what vanilla Kubernetes cluster already has. And even co uh, core control plane functionality, which we're not going to talk uh, today, but th there's been research around how to abuse, for example, Kubernetes API server for CSRF. OK. Let's dive into the uh, specific use cases. Uh, we'll start with the persistent. For this, we'll use our shackle Pokemon, which is a symbol of persistence, of course. Um, so as a symbol of persistence, we'll, we'll abuse the node problem detector. Now, for those of you who, who never heard about node problem detector, it's a tool that's present on all GKE and AKS clusters. In fact, it's a system D process on the worker nodes. It can be installed as a diamond set as well. And it's also installed on many EKS clusters because it appears in the recommendation on the best practices guide where they say go and install it as a diamond set. This process, it performs various diagnostics activities. It runs as root on the node and uh, makes sure the, uh, the health of the node is fine by performing various activities. So let's focus on the GKE. Let's see how it looks on the GKE. If you, if you run PSA UX on the worker node, this is what you get. You get the NPD process with a bunch of dash dash config configurations and a bunch of those JSONs. What are those JSONs saying? They're saying what to do, what diagnostics action to perform. So in this case, CCTL monitor JSON says every six hours, I hope you see, you see the, the fourth line, every six hours run this Python with the following parameter. Okay, good. As an attacker, we immediately say, what can we do if we override this JSON? Well, not much, because you still need to restart the node problem detector, right, to, to get the new config. And that may be a bit noisy. However, what can we do if we manage to override the Python? Right? So you see where I'm going with that. Before we uh, put together demo and attack chain, quickly I want to talk to you about leaky vessels. Uh, which was a set of vulnerabilities. Uh, who here heard about leaky vessels? Yeah, okay, so I'll be very, uh, very short. Set of vulnerabilities, run C, build kit, allows attackers to build time escape and container runtime escape. Okay, and that's what we're going to use in the demo. So now we can put together attack chain. Attacker uses compromised image, poisoned image, you name it, uses leaky vessels to escape on the node. We overwrite as an attackers the Python, the CCTL monitor Python, and we let node problem uh, detector to pick the new and execute the new Python. The new Python will communicate with the C2 server. What will we achieve by this? We'll bypass kube audit, we'll bypass admission controller, of course, because we're not going through the Kubernetes API access. That one is blind to our actions. We'll probably bypass sensor EDR solution. Why? Because we're piggybacking on a known process. Privilege escalation, persistency, 
evasion. Okay, let's see this in action. Okay, so on the left side, I have access to the pod. Uh, that's a GKE pod. And Andy Dufresne is my uh, hacking pod that, on, that has execution on the, po on the node. That's, that's its on, only person, purpose. So I'm showing you that the host name of the node is GKE SHA something. That's our worker node. And now I'm showing you the content of this, that CTL monitor JSON. You see the location, npd custom plugin slash config. That's on the node. And now I'm showing you the content of the CCTL monitor Python that we will overwrite. Now, it's not in very interesting. It's just diagnostic pod that node problem detector runs periodically every six hours. It's OK, but we will overwrite it. That's the interesting part. How will we overwrite it? By using the malicious image. So unsuspecting cl uh, cluster operator will run this innocent image called CV2024-21626. Um, this image in the bottom right corner, as you can see, uses this work there. It abuses the leaky vessel's run C vulnerability. It has only one command. It overrides the existing CCTL monitor.py on the node. You see that path traversal slash home slash Kubernetes with our own CCTL monitor.py, which what it does, just a good old Python reverse shell to our C2 server. At the bottom top corner, uh, at the top right corner, you see our C2 server running on port 444, and now cluster operator is running the, starting the image, and it's done. You see leaky completed, okay. Something happened, so it pulled the image. So I guess it worked, but of course we need to check. So let's see how the actual Python looks like. I'm dumping the Python. And you can see that the, this is a new Python code. OK? So the leaky vessels worked. Good. Now what we need to do, we just need to, to wait for six hours for the reverse shell connection. Of course, I trimmed the video. Uh, so now any, any moment now, there we go. We have the connection on the C2 server. The connection is a root on the worker node. You can see the host name, the host name of the worker node. We have access to all the processes, including the node problem detector by itself. We don't have any namespace restrictions. And we have access to var lib kubelet, where, of course, kubelet keeps all the information about local pods, including service account tokens, etc. So pretty cool, if you ask me. All right, so that's persistency. Let's move on to collection. Collection for people who are into the Pokemons. Uh, I think Paragon <laughs> is the one that represents the collection uh, information assembly. So I hope you see where I'm going with that. FluentBit. Okay. FluentBit um, is a very known log management processor and management solution. We love it because it's installed by default on GKE and AKS, and it's recommended for installation on EKS BP, BP Guide as well. The configuration affecting the Fluent bit is going through the config map, fluent-bit-config. And this config looks like this, looks as follows. There's a sec uh, sequence of input parser filter commands, uh, sorry, uh, sections which tells FluentBit what to do, which logs to, uh, to assemble and where to send them. Now, as an attacker, we immediately ask, ask ourselves, OK, if we can modify it, what happens? Good things happen, because we can use exec plugin. As an attacker, of course, we, we love plugins that's, that's called exec, because they do exactly that. They execute the commands. So in this case, this is an example from the official documentation of the Fluent bit, where ls slash var slash log will execute every one second. OK, how can we abuse it? So here's our attack chain. Assuming we have update on the config map permissions, OK, or more, or more powerful permissions, but that's the ARBIC that we need, we will add input session and output session sections to the config map. 
and we will let new Fluent bit pods to get the new config map and to send the logs to C2, data exfiltration. And again, we bypass cube audit, we bypass cube admission controller, we bypass sensor, and our malicious config map is resistant to restarts because now it resides in its CD. So again, we achieve collection, we achieve persistency, we achieve evasion. Okay, let's see this in action. I hope you can, you can hear me because the noise is quite serious there. Uh, okay, so on the left, you see that I'm running two Fluent Bit pods because it's a daemon set, I have two nodes. Now I'm showing you the config map that affect, that's affecting the Fluent Bit config. It's called fluent-bit slash config. And by the way, this is EKS cluster. I guess you can, you can see this by uh, Amazon slash dash CloudWatch namespace. Now, this is the content of this config map. It's pretty messy when unformatted, but it starts with application-log.conf and it defines the, the collection of certain application logs. But what I want, I want to show you is our malicious Fluent Bit config that is very similar to original config. However, it adds two small sections. It abuses that exact plugin that I was talking about, input, output, in the input, we're asking FluentBit, please execute hostname and ID and ls-la every five seconds. We control the interval and send it to our C2 server on port 4444 over plain HTTP. That's it. So now I'm starting my C2 server, Python, whatever, and applying the new config map. and hoping that it'll work. So nothing happened, why? Because the pods still haven't applied the new config, right? So here, I'm killing the pod on purpose, the second pod, I'm gonna kill it, and because it's a daemon set, daemon set, the new pod will respawn and pick the new configuration. In the production cluster, however, there is a natural process of shrinking and growing. So every new node that come up, comes up because of the scheduling or load, they will pick the new config, the malicious config. All right, so now I'm deleting the pod, and I expect the new pod to start automatically. There it is, the last pod, you see five seconds? That's the new pod, so now any moment now, oh, we're getting the information. We're getting the output of Fluent Bit running those shell commands. You can see the first one is exec, the second one is uh, hostname, sorry, the first one is hostname, second one is ID, and then the output of that. And you see the user agent is Fluent Bit. And Fluent Bit is so nice that it's packing, it's in, in a nice JSON, uh, it, uh, timestamps every command that it's run, so because it's of course log management solution. Oops. All right, and at this point, I'm passing to Ronan for privilege escalation. All right, thank you, Shai. Uh, so now we'll talk a bit about privilege escalation techniques. Um, so from CSAS guidance, uh, they show us basically a lot of uh, privilege escalation techniques on cloud environments. However, of course, we are at KubeCon and we are interested um, in managed clusters. Uh, so let's see how we can use those privilege escalation techniques and apply those on managed clusters. Uh, so the first example we chose to show you today um, is the Azure Kubernetes service, and more specifically, how we can use the entry ID authentication uh, combined with some user misconfigurations uh, in our advantage. Um, so let's first uh, see uh, how many like different authentication and authorization methods um, AKS offers. Uh, so the first one is local accounts with Kubernetes role with access control, uh, basically the one we all know. Uh, the second one is the entry ID uh, with the Kubernetes role-based access control, basically maintaining the authorization model. 
And the third one uh, is the Entry ID authentication, but this time it is combined with the Azure Always Access Control, uh, which is Azure's own uh, controls, which are not explicitly um, unique uh, to the Kubernetes. It also supports uh, many other services. So in the next few slides, we'll focus only on clusters which are configured with the Entry ID authentication. Um, so let's imagine we are a regular user and we want to perform some kind of operations in our cluster. Um, how will it look like? Um, so we first have to perform a login to our, entry, to, to our identity provider. In our case, it's the entry ID. Um, next, we'll receive a token, which we'll then use uh, against our Kubernetes cluster. If you use the Azure CLI or uh, other things, your kube cuttle already should be uh, ready to do so automatically. Uh, so then we'll perform our operation with the token. And actually, behind the scenes, uh, it will perform the authentication against an external um, uh, webhook server, uh, which will then uh, validate the JWT token, uh, perform the Microsoft API graph for uh, various user details, and return it back uh, to the Kubernetes API server, uh, which will now have to authorize the request. Uh, in some cases, uh, there are also another external uh, webhook server which are, is responsible for the authorization. Uh, but if, uh, for example, the Kubernetes API server authorizes the request, then it will also perform the request and return the data back to the user. Now, I think the most interesting part uh, in this section is we're still authenticating with the entry ID. Uh, and it means uh, that basically every service principle uh, every user in our directory, which directory is basically equivalent to tenant, uh, will be able to authenticate to our cluster. Now, it doesn't mean they'll be automatically granted to perform any uh, operations on our cluster, but they'll still be authenticated. Uh, and let's keep that in mind in the next few slides. Um, so let's imagine we somehow obtained random service principal credentials in our uh, directory. Uh, how will it look like when we want to authenticate uh, to perform some kind of operations on a cluster which is configured with the entry ID? Um, so we first will use those credentials uh, and we'll have to generate a token which we'll then use uh, against our cluster. And we can do this uh, with the curl command. Uh, next, we'll use kubectl against our cluster and, for example, perform the get secret operation. And of course, we've been denied because we're not authorized to perform any operation. Um, however, let's see what do the log shows uh, behind the scenes. So we can see the response status, um, basically the same error we received before. Uh, but let's focus on the user section and more specifically on the groups. Um, so we can see that we are part of the system authenticated group. We are a random user in our directory is part of the system authenticated group, uh, which basically groups all the authenticated uh, identities. And now why is it even interesting for us? Um, so we've seen many cases uh, that uh, cluster administrators tend to uh, trust the system authenticated group and bind to it uh, roles which may contain higher privileges. So this uh, basically combined uh, with your ability to authenticate uh, to a cluster configured with the entry ID can be an open door for privilege escalation and lateral movement techniques. Uh, now, funnily, uh, Jiki also behaved the same. I think a couple of months ago, a uh, security researcher found that every Google account could authenticate to any Jiki cluster uh, and be also part of the system authenticating group. And they also found the same result uh, that many users tend to trust the system authenticated group and bind to it a uh, role which may contain uh, higher privileges. Uh, so now let's see a short demo on how it works. All right, so excuse us for the small font. Um, so um, Let's uh, say we have a cluster which is configured with the entry ID authentication, and we have a cluster role binding which binds uh, uh, the powerful role to the system authenticated group, uh, basically grants us pod, uh, get pod, uh, list pods, and all, all those stuff, list secrets. And now we'll use a random service principal credentials uh, to generate a token which will be uh, then used against uh, our Kubernetes cluster, which is configured with the entry ID. Um, then we'll use the token, for example, to perform the get deployments operation. Uh, and we can see uh, that, of course, we've been denied because we are not authorized to perform the operation. But let's see what uh, actually we can do. 
Uh, and we can see that we can uh, get pods, list pods, and list secrets uh, because we are indeed part of the system authenticated group. Um, so let's try uh, and use our permissions now uh, to get those uh, resources. All right. So that's basically it for the demo. And now uh, we'll talk about uh, AKS pod identity. Um, so for those who are not familiar with the AKS pod identity, uh, it's a new feature AWS released, uh, I think, a couple months ago also. Uh, and basically helps bridging uh, access of service accounts to AWS resources. Uh, now, in the next few slides, uh, we'll see an example of how uh, we can use uh, the, pod, the AKS pod identity in our advantage using the host network through uh, configuration. So let's see uh, at a very high level how it works. Uh, I won't really get into details. Uh, so after installing the AKS pod identity add-on on our cluster, we're introduced with two new endpoints. And uh, the first is a pod identity webhook, uh, and the second one is a daemon set called EKS pod identity agent, which actually serves as an uh, identity uh, role uh, fetcher, let's say. So from now on, uh, each pod uh, which, is con which is configured with a service account that wants to have an access to AWS resources and is configured to have a role, uh, will actually perform an HTTP request to the EKS pod identity daemon set, which sits on the same worker node, and will basically ask it to fetch uh, the necessary role. Um, and of course, it will do that, and it will return uh, the role to the pod, and then it will be able to access uh, its configured uh, AWS resources. Uh, so now let's see how we can use that uh, with the host network true configuration uh, as a possible attacker. Um, so uh, let's say we have a, a worker node which contains uh, two pods. Um, the first pod is pod A, um, which contains uh, the host network true configuration. Uh, for those who are not familiar with what is host network true configuration, it basically allows the pod to access the network adapters of uh, the worker node. Uh, with the right capabilities, it also allows a network capture of all the traffic uh, from the worker node. Uh, and let's assume the malicious actor is, was able to get access to pod A. And next we'll have pod B, uh, uh, which will happen to have a service account uh, which has access to S3 buckets. Now, uh, the slide before, I told you that to have uh, an access now for uh, those resources, it first has to send a request uh, behind the scenes to the EKS pod identity agent, which sits on the same uh, worker node. Um, and then uh, it will receive the necessary token uh, that will allow it to access the S3 buckets. Uh, now, because from pod A uh, we have the capability to uh, perform a network capture, we can possibly capture the, uh, the token received from the EKS pod identity to pod B uh, because uh, the traffic between them is HTTP and not HTTPS. So uh, now let's see a demo on uh, how it works. All right, so on the left side, we'll create a pod, uh, which will have the host network true configuration, and basically allow uh, an attacker to perform a network capture. Uh, we'll also have another pod, which we'll call a bucket reader, uh, which will have a service account, which is configured to have access to an S3 bucket, and we'll try to simulate, uh, the, for example, the STS get caller identity, to basically show us uh, what role do we have, and behind the scenes, it should uh, perform a request to the EKS pod identity uh, and receive its role. Uh, on the right side, we'll now uh, perform the network capture. Uh, and then we'll see that we are able to capture the response from the EKS pod identity agent uh, and receive the token. So uh, we can see that we, are able, uh, we were able to uh, basically receive the token from the EKS pod identity by a network capture. And now we can use that, for example, uh, from uh, pod A, which is an attacker, uh, to access the identity and possibly the S3 bucket of uh, pod uh, B. So now I'll pass the mic back to Shai uh, to conclude our presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Renan. So that was privileged escalation from the Kubernetes into the cloud. Okay. So I guess 
impact is also one of the uh, stages that impacted by the living of the land techniques. All right. So I hope we persuaded you that there's a real problem out there in managed Kubernetes clusters. And we need to do something about it. What can we do, though? Well, how about we start with awareness? How about we update the threat matrix to include living on the land components, such as node problem detector, fluent bit, and there are others as well that we didn't include in the presentation. That's a good first step. But maybe we can do more. We're planning to create a project, a GitHub or website, that will collect those techniques, something like a lolbus project, maybe kubelols. If you have funny little witty name that you want to suggest for this project, ping us. We'll be happy to hear that. Also, we would love to encourage the CSPs to publish whatever they have in the managed clusters, KBOM or call it any other word, but ultimately the users want to know what they run in the clusters. Okay, right now that's not the, uh, that's not the situation. Think about vulnerability management. How can we trace, how do we know in which clusters, which versions we have vulnerable component? We don't. So we realize this, this is not everything, but I think this is a good several steps towards, the, towards solving the problem, towards that same baseline that CISA guidance talks about. Uh, but we probably don't really understand what the baseline looks like. But it's a step into the right direction, I think. Okay, this is all we have for today. Thank you all for attending. If you have questions, feel free, but we're going to hang around here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Yes, I have a hi. question. Uh, you showed a nice example with the Fluent Beat, but generally, whatever solution do you use, uh, you use for logs. Uh, current situation in Kubernetes is that it's always going to be high privileged pod. Logs are generally just reading a stream of text, right? So, is there really a need to have high privileged pod for such a simple use case? And are you aware of any work in Kubernetes ecosystem to change that architecturally? Well, uh, it's not really high privilege pod. It's just the the fluent bit actually has just sensitive mappings into var lib kubelet in order to collect the logs. Yeah. So it's not high privilege. It just exfiltrates the data, right? And the key here is just to understand the risks in your managed clusters. Let's say CSPs provide us that don't tell us that if you give config map update permission to somebody else, that can lead to the whole cluster compromise. They don't say it. Right? But it's true. It's the reality. So I think that's the, the knowing those risks is a good first step. But I agree. I don't think everything can be non-privileged. OK. Thanks. Thank you.